right, yeah, so we're going to talk a bit today about uh, bankruptcy, and I'm going to give a bit of an overview of bankruptcy, uh, basically what I tell my clients about it, so you'll get uh, well educated about that. And then we're going to talk about some of the things that are happening on the bankruptcy horizon right now, and then uh, we'll get into a little bit about what you might want to discuss with a client who gets a foreclosure notice. And then um, the, the last segment we'll talk about is sort of the intersection of bankruptcy and divorce. So if uh, you are family law practitioners and you've got a client or uh, maybe jointly with their spouse who may need to file bankruptcy or maybe a former divorce client where they need to file or their former spouse has filed bankruptcy on it, we'll talk about some of those issues. So the first thing you need to know about Chapter 7 is it is a very powerful tool. As soon as a case is filed, there is what's called a stay that's in effect, which stops any sort of action against the debtor. The ultimate goal that debtors want to get is what's called a discharge, which is a court order that all of their debts are wiped out. Now Chapter 7 bankruptcy is sometimes referred to as liquidation of debt which is sort of a misnomer because very few cases actually get liquidated. And, and I should just clarify, I am going to be talking today about 7s and 13s in consumer bankruptcies. A lot of my clients are self-employed, doing you know, various things, or maybe they have failed businesses or whatever. We're not going to be talking a lot about corporate type bankruptcies, Chapter 11s or Farm Chapter 12s or anything like that. <coughs> So 95% of the people that I see can protect all of their assets and their case becomes a no asset case. Sometimes people do have assets and then that ends up getting paid pro rata to creditors. There's different priority rules, child support and taxes would get paid first and then general unsecured creditors get paid after that. The Easiest, and you know, sometimes somebody has assets coming into a bankruptcy, we can do what's called pre bankruptcy planning, where we can get rid of certain assets, liquidate them, spend down the proceeds so that they don't have to pay anything in. Sometimes it's just as good to just bite the bullet and file it as an asset case and pay what they need to pay, particularly if they don't have the luxury of time because uh, they're getting garnished or something like that. Now, one of the big things uh, you're probably all aware, they changed the laws. Uh, you can't call it the new laws anymore. It's in 2005, and it was called uh, BAP CEPA, the Bankruptcy Abuse Protection and Consumer Protection Act, or something like that. And uh, sometimes called it the Bankruptcy Act of Reform, or BARF, as they would call it. <laughs> and it. Um, one of the, the biggest change it made was that they had this threshold for who are the high income debtors who were supposedly abusing the provisions of getting a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. And we had unwritten rules prior to that, which was developed in case law and it varied from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So now we've got more uh, ironclad black letter law on that. And the first and the easiest and best way to qualify for a Chapter 7 is by being under what we call the median income, which uh, the United States Trustee's Office publishes those figures. They get updated for inflation twice a year. And the, I, I kind of know them in my head because I deal with it all the time. So it's a function of household size. For a household of one, the median is 50000 a year. For a household of two, it's 62000 a year. For a household of three, 78000 For a household of four, is now 92000 And then beyond that, it's $7,000 per person. The time frame that they use in determining the income is the six months prior to filing. So sometimes if we have people who make all their money in the summer and then they collect unemployment all winter, we time the filing of their case in the spring so that they can qualify. Now, if you're under the median, you're pretty much in like Flynn in a Chapter 7. If you're over the median, it's not that you're disqualified. It's that you have to go through an additional test, at least if your debts are primarily consumer debts and they count the mortgage towards that. So almost everybody is primarily consumer debts. 
And that test is called the means test. And the means test is, well, it's complicated for the client. It's complicated for me. I charge more for it. And sometimes people mean that they can't get a Chapter 7 discharge, and they'll get at least investigated and maybe a motion to dismiss their case from the United States trustee. Well, the means test is basically a governmental budgeting test that we do for over median debtors where pretty much everything off of their paycheck gets deducted except for voluntary retirement contributions. And then we do a budget which is based in part on their actual expenses, in part on standardized expenses that you get off of a governmental chart which the United States trustee has now compiled for everybody. And, and uh, there's, you might have actual expenses that don't go on the means test. They might give you expenses on the means test that you don't actually incur. Sometimes you can take the greater of the standard or your actual expense. So it's pretty complicated. I've heard there's some websites where you can do it. But to really do it and get it done right is typically a two-hour consultation that I do. I have my clients do a bunch of work for it in advance we go, we go through all the detail on their six months of pay stubs and then we roll up our sleeves and get it all figured out and if we can get them into a chapter seven which i usually can if they're within 15 to 20 percent of the median if they're a lot more than that then they, they better have some real good means test expenses uh ironically secured debts are good so if you got two identical debtors who live next door to each other and one guy's driving a 20 year old car and a 15 year old car and the guy next door has a brand new Lexus and a Hummer in a driveway that he can't afford. He has to get rid of them in a boat in a cabin that's upside down he has to get rid of all. The guy with all the secured debt is going to qualify and without all the other deductions the other person might not qualify so you get rewarded for, for having toys uh, even if you're going to get rid of them. This is secured debts that is. So if you can't qualify for um, Chapter 7 because of the means test and we can't figure out a way to get you to do it, then we can look into a Chapter 13. So chapter 13 is uh, usually a fallback option for over median debtors. If you're, you can still do a Chapter 13 if you're under the median. Typical reasons for being in a Chapter 13 would be to cure mortgage arrears to stop a foreclosure, which we'll get into that in a bit. Um, paying off taxes, uh, which can be paid through a Chapter 13 with no interest, and sometimes paying off child support if, if uh, or back child support, if there's a good reason to do that. Sometimes it's more beneficial to do that than it is to have 20% taken on top of your ongoing child support. Another reason we can get into Chapter 13s is if people do have non-exempt assets that they want to keep. For instance, maybe they refinanced their house and just bought a $20,000 car, which is going to exceed their exemptions in a Chapter 7. They can keep that car by paying the $20,000 or whatever the non-exempt portion is over three to five years in a Chapter 13 plan. If you're over the median income, you have to do a five-year plan unless you can pay everybody 100% less than that. And if you're under the median income, you have the option of doing a three to five year plan. So in the chapter 13, you can still get a partial discharge. You can wipe out 99% of your unsecured debt as long as you're paying in your disposable income. So that's always the big thing is not everybody has a willy nilly choice to just say, should I do a seven or a 13? It's a function of their budget. It's supposed to be if you can afford to pay your creditors, you should do a 13. If you can't, you should do a Chapter 7. But if someone's close to the median income, it's usually not too hard to adjust their budget. Sometimes it's a function of whether they get rid of a car or um, whether we include their taxes in their Chapter 7 budget. So there's different ways we can get around that. A couple of other uh, bankruptcy topics that I want to uh, talk about before I start uh, moving my screens along here is the issue of uh, preferences in a chapter 7 and there's two different things that you need to understand in chapter 7 is that preferences can get avoided and preferences are payments that are made to creditors prior to a bankruptcy. There's a couple of different rules there. There's a rule on, um, on 
involuntary transfers such as garnishment and things like that. And um, if payments have been garnished in the 90 days uh, prior to the uh, Chapter 7, then that, is, that can get avoided by the trustee, but if the debtor has room to protect it, and most debtors do because there's a $12,000 miscellaneous exemption, then the, uh, the debtor can actually recover that. So one of the really cool things I can do when someone comes into me and they're getting garnished is we can file the bankruptcy and not only stop the garnishment, but then we can demand back the money that had been taken from them, which, you know, sometimes they get a check back for two to $3,000 before the horse issue is that they need to pay me first and then they get that money later when they get it back. Um, if payments have been made voluntarily, that gets to be a bit of an issue, particularly if payments have been made to creditors. Now for the recovery of involuntary garnishments, there's a 90 day look back, there's a $600 floor, and then the top end is the amount uh, that people can protect as an asset, which is the you know, miscellaneous exemption under the federal exemptions is $12,000. Um, if payments have been made voluntarily to a relative in the one year prior to bankruptcy, then once people file bankruptcy, the trustee can avoid that transaction by suing the relative, which ends up becoming a real problem because a lot of times we get that people came in, they got their tax refund, they paid their $5,000 back to their dad that they owe, and then they file bankruptcy. And that becomes an issue. So we, we work around that a lot of different ways. Sometimes you just suck it up and you let the dad pay, or sometimes the dad's insolvent and you let the trustee go after him. Uh, sometimes you lay out the year, and sometimes you can do a chapter 13 and spread that out over three years. or one of the defenses that the relative would have would be what's called new value. So if the relative has lent money back to the debtor prior to filing, then that relative would have a defense as to any cause of action that the trustee would have. So a lot of times that's what we do. We borrow the money back, sometimes spend it down, sometimes you can protect it, and file on the relative, and then you can pay them back after the case is filed. That's not a problem to voluntarily pay back creditors even though technically they're discharged. It's just the time frame prior to the bankruptcy that creates issues. At uh, the conclusion of a Chapter 7 case, and basically the procedure is we file it a month later, we go downtown. If you're in Oka County, they do it in, in uh, Federal Courthouse in Minneapolis. You meet the trustee, creditors get invited, they rarely show up. And then two months after that, there's a discharge, which is the court order saying that everything is wiped out. When the discharge comes through, the, um, if people have judgments against them prior to the bankruptcy, the judgments become void by operation of law, but they don't actually go away. They'll stay on their credit report, and then they go away after the 10 years. They can't be renewed. So it doesn't hurt people if they don't care about their credit, but sometimes people want to clean up their credit, perhaps go buy a house. They can't buy a house if they have a judgment, even if the judgment, the underlying debt on the judgment has been discharged in the bankruptcy. So there's a state law procedure that can be followed uh, subsequent to a bankruptcy. It's not too complicated. You don't have to be a bankruptcy attorney to do it. It can be done in state law. It's, it's in, uh, 548, I don't know the study off the top of my head, but um, one thing on that is the statute says that there's a $5 fee on that to apply for the discharge of a judgment. And the state court administrators have recently taken the position that applying for this is filing a first paper in a case and requires a court fee of $322. And at first I thought, well, yeah, I get it. It's just like in family law, you got to pay your initial filing fee, and then subsequently if you bring a motion, you have to bring the $100 motion fee, and if you hadn't paid the original fee, you got to pay both of them. If you read the language of the statutes, it's not similar to that at all. It's pretty clear. So that's something that uh, is likely to get uh, resolved. If not by the legislature, there might be some court action on that. In fact, I was talking to someone this morning who's got something going on. Blue Earth in the Conlon County, and I might be bringing a 
couple of these here in Elton County for myself in the next few weeks. So, the one other thing I just want to talk about uh, is in uh, one of the other big changes of the 2005 Act is what's called credit counsel. So now prior to a bankruptcy, people have to go through two steps. One is an initial step to see if it's supposed to be a diversionary step to see if they have bankruptcy alternatives. I always go through with my clients if they have better alternatives than bankruptcy, but so apparently when the creditors lobbied this act, they thought that bankruptcy attorneys weren't objective enough, so they have people go through a third party, and, and that whole industry has just turned into low bidder, so it's all computerized and it costs 11 bucks. After people file, they have to do a secondary thing, which is supposed to be a debtor education class, so that needs to be done after the case is filed as well. The <coughs> bankruptcy filings in Minnesota, I hope you can see that. I have this uh, little graph, and you can, it goes back to uh, 1997. And the uh, filings in Minnesota kind of mirrored what they've been doing across the country, which is that they were slowly growing through the <coughs> first part of the 20 O's. And then in 2005, when it became clear that this bankruptcy law, which had been uh, in the works for about five years, in fact, I remember at one point uh, there was a, a 99 to 1 vote in the Senate to have it go through, and Paul Wellstone was the one. And, uh, but he was able to somehow stop it. Some, and, uh, but it, that was about three years prior. And then finally in April 2005, they said it's going through. <coughs> they put a six month sunset on the old law. So there was a real spike that practically doubled the people, well, clearly fewer than half of the people um, filed the next year in 2006, as everybody was trying to figure out what's going on. And basically the, the new law kind of doubled or tripled the amount of work that attorneys do. And to a certain degree, I think it's, it's all good stuff because we were really getting away with slot before that. I mean, people would come in, they'd say, I make 15 bucks an hour, I wouldn't look at their tax return, I wouldn't look at their pay stubs, I would just write down, it's uh, 30 grand a year, that's 2,500 a month, and their taxes are probably about 600 bucks, and I'd put together a budget, and you'd never get questioned on that. And now when people tell you that, and you look at their pay stubs, and you look at their tax return, sometimes you find out that it's a lot different. So it's really improved the quality of the cases that have come through the, the bankruptcy system. And, um, and as you can see with the, uh, the filings, as the economy uh, uh, worsened through uh, 2007 and 8, 9 and 10, uh, the filings increased dramatically. And now they've been on a downslide, and that's through 2013. And the first quarter of 2014 is similarly down about 10% from 2013, the first quarter. This little chart shows Anoka County foreclosures. This goes back to 2008, which is all the further I can go back, but it uh, shows a similar downward slope. There were a, a lot more uh, homes being foreclosed upon in Anoka County during the peak of the crisis. And, um, and that is going down now in, in the news I just saw a few days ago is that uh, Twin Cities increase in home values in the last year has been uh, in the top 10 in the country. So a lot more people are able to save their homes now and, and uh, the ones that can't uh, kind of been flushed through the system. So, uh, but there's still a lot of people out there that are hanging on in uh, adjustable rate mortgages and with the, you know, the all-time lows that we've had for the last 10 years or so, when those rates start going up, unless Congress is going to step in and have another program, which we've got a lot of them. So usually people with the bad arms, where uh, their rate all of a sudden skyrocketed up to 9% and their mortgage payment double, they either modified, modified their mortgage or have lost their home. So I don't know that there's a lot of there's a lot of people out there with good arms that are paying 2.75% interest, and if those things adjust, uh, then there might be another wave of foreclosures. 